Hindustani is a language spoken in India and Pakistan. It's known as a pluricentric language as it has two standard registers, modern standard Hindi and modern standard Urdu. Hindi is one of 22 official languages in India, written in the Devanagari script. It's spoken by 528 million people as a first language and 139 million as a second language. Urdu is spoken as a primary language by 14.8 million Pakistanis, accounting for 7% of the population, but the language is spoken and understood by over 159 million Pakistanis, about 75% of the population. Urdu is also spoken by 53 million people in India. Together, Hindustani has over 785 million speakers, making it the third most widely spoken language on earth. First, let's have a look at Hindustani's history. Hindustani used to be a single language. It had a lot of Persian, Arabic and Turkic influence due to the Delhi Sultanate and later the Mughal Empire. Persian gradually became the state language of the Mughal Empire. Hindustani descends from a language called Shoraseni, a medieval Indo-Aryan language of central India. After the 10th century, many Shoraseni dialects became standing dialects or Kariboli including the language spoken in Delhi. Due to contact between Hindus and Muslims in Hindustan, the Delhi Sultanate combined Hindustani with a whole lot of Persian, Arabic and Turkic words. At this point, it was called Hindavi or Dahlavi alongside Hindustani. The language was written in the Perso-Arabic and the Vnagali scripts mostly, but vocabulary and script differed on region and its culture. Towards the end of the Mughal period, a variant of Hindustani began replacing Persian as the lingua franca among the upper class. This language was standardized and Persianized and it came to be known as Urdu, short for Zabane Urdu e Muwalla, the language of the exalted camp. Urdu's first poet, Amir Khusro, of Persian descent, composed folk songs, riddles, and couplets in Persian, Arabic, and mixed speech. His poems would feature multiple languages like Persian and Hindustani. This mixed speech was what eventually evolved into Urdu. By the late 11th century, Hindustani had become the lingua franca of most of northern India. His poems are still sung around India and Pakistan, 750 years after they were first written. In 1857, Urdu became the official language of British India alongside English. This action angered Hindus, who believed that the language should have been written in the Devanagari script. Before the switch to literary Hindustani in the 19th century, one of the major languages called Braj Pasha was predominantly spoken in North Central India and was spoken in Delhi, also referred to as the Delhi dialect. Efforts to promote a Devanagari version of this Delhi dialect started gaining traction around 1880 in an attempt to displace Urdu of its official position. Because of these efforts, two new languages arose. Hindi, which purged a lot of its Persian and Arabic vocabulary for Sanskrit words, and Urdu, which purged a lot of its Sanskrit words for more Persian and Arabic ones. Nowadays, a Hindi speaker and an Urdu speaker can have a conversation no problem at all. But if they had to say, write a letter to each other, that's where the issue arises. Back to the modern day, let's have a look at Hindustani's phonology. The language is known for having retroflex consonants. To produce a retroflex sound, you need to curl your tongue back in your mouth. For example, D becomes D or D becomes D is a retroflex R R and aspirated stops as well. This means Hindustani distinguishes between D, D, D and D. As for vowels, Hindustani has nasal vowels. They're seen in words like meh, banch and gaha. So what's Hindustani's grammar like? Well, let's begin with nouns. Nouns inflect for two genders, masculine and feminine. They're further split into two declensions, in other words, masculine one and masculine two, as well as feminine one and feminine two. They also inflect for three cases, but I'll talk more in depth about those later. Nouns also take postpositions. For example, the genitive marker ka, as in larke ka seb, the boy's apple. Ko is the dative marker, as in usko de do, give it to him. Se has a lot of meanings, but is mostly used as an ablative marker, as in udhar se, from there. Then there's the ergative marker, ne. In the shortest possible way I can explain, Hindustani is a split ergative language. What that means is that the object of a transitive verb is treated the same as the subject of an intransitive verb. It's basically like saying her likes she. Before I move on, let me just define these two terms in case you didn't already know what they mean. If a verb is transitive, it means that it takes an object. For example, eat is transitive because you can eat something. The verb can take an object. But if a verb is intransitive, it doesn't take an object. For example, sleep is intransitive because you can't sleep something. Now that we've got that out of the way, let's look at case marking. When it comes to intransitive clauses, the rule is straightforward. The subject is always in the direct case and the verb agrees with the subject of the sentence. For example, Larka kal soya means the boy slept yesterday, 
Larka is in the direct case, and Soya from the verb sona to sleep in flex for the masculine singular. As for transitive clauses, there are three possible ways this can go. If the clause is perfective and has an animate or a definite object, the agent takes the ergative clitic ne and the object takes the accusative marker ko. For example, the boy has driven the car is larke ne gari ko chalaya hai. Boy, ergative marker, car, accusative marker, driven. If the clause is perfective and has an inanimate or indefinite object, the agent will still have the ergative marker, but the object will be in the direct case. The verb will also agree with the object of the sentence. So now the sentence will be Larke ne gari chalai hai. Gari is feminine, so the verb chalana will inflect with a feminine singular. And if the clause isn't perfective, the agent is in the direct case and agrees with the verb. Now we'll have Larka gari chalata hai, in which both the subject and object of the sentence is in the direct case. Moving on from nouns, let's talk about verbs. First, verbs have three aspects. The habitual, which implies an action is recurring. The perfective and the progressive, implying an action is ongoing. The continuous aspect form is indicated using the participle raha from the verb to stay, rehna. There are also five moods. The indicative, used for stating facts. The conditional, the subjunctive, the imperative, and the presumptive, used to express hypothesis. For example, wo school gay hogi pichli mahine means she must have gone to the school last month. Apart from that, verbs also have reflexive and causative forms. Taking the verb girna to fall as an example, you can have girana meaning to make something fall and girvana to cause something to be fallen. Hindustani also uses a lot of compound verbs. For example, ana means to come and combining it with the verb jana to go, you get ajana to have come. Parna to read can be combined with dena to give, to get pardena to read out. Karna to do can be combined with lena to take, to mean karlena to have finished doing. Another cool thing about Hindi Urdu grammar is conjunct verbs. It's basically when you have a noun or an adjective and pair it with a verbalizer, essentially turning the phrase into a verb. For example, band means closed, and combining it with the verbalizer hona to be makes band hona, to close. Khatam hona means to finish. Saaf karna means to clean, and so forth. Hindustani is an SOV language, but it generally has a free word order. In free word order, the general rule is the first word in the sentence is most emphasized and the word at the end is least emphasized. For example, to say I am a man, you'd usually say main admi hu, but you can also say admi me hu or hu admi me. What's also fun about Hindustani is the way it handles relative clauses. A relative clause in English is something like the man who ate dinner or the car which doesn't start. To do this, Hindustani uses correlative clauses, which can go before or after the entire clause. For example, to say he didn't speak, you can say usne nahi bhula tha. But to say the person who didn't speak is tall, you can say jo nahi bhula tha, wo lamba tha. You can translate the sentence literally as he who did not speak, he was tall. As I mentioned earlier, both languages write with different scripts. Let's start with Hindi. The Devanagari script, written from left to right, is called an abhigida, meaning that vowels are indicated by adding modifications to consonants. In other words, this is ka, but adding a line in front becomes ka. A sign below makes ku, a line above makes ki. You get the idea. The Devanagari script does distinguish between aspirated and retroflex consonants. Therefore, dal means lentils, but dal means a branch and dal means a shield. Urdu, on the other hand, uses the Nastalik script, which is a calligraphic abjad, meaning that vowel sounds aren't written unless they're long vowels. Nastalik is an extension of the Paso Arabic script, which itself is an extension of the Arabic script. Nastalik actually has a lot of duplicate letters. This is because the Arabic script has symbols for a lot of sounds that Urdu didn't have. Because of that, you can write the S sound with these characters, Z with these, and H with these. While an Arabic speaker may read this word as Tabi'at, an Urdu speaker would read it as Tabi'at. So Hindi and Urdu are very similar languages, but what are the differences in vocabulary? Here's just a few differences in Urdu and Hindi words. Saying thanks. In Urdu, Shukriya from Arabic Shukran, and in Hindi, Dhanyavad from Sanskrit Dhanya, blessed, and Vada, speech. The word for air. In Urdu, Hava from Arabic Hawa, and in Hindi, Vayu from Sanskrit Vayu. The word for door. In Urdu, Darvaza from Persian Darvaza, and in Hindi, Dvar from Sanskrit Dvara. 
finally the word for independence. In Urdu, Azadi, from Persian Azadi, and in Hindi, Swatantrata, from Sanskrit, in which it's pronounced the same. You can see that the differences always arise from words being borrowed from different languages, and despite these minor differences, a Hindi and Urdu speaker can still converse just fine. To end this video, let's analyze some sentences in Hindi and Urdu. Dukan ke bahar se bavarchi ke saad nahi milna. Dukan means store, and adding ke bahar se is an elative marker, meaning outside. Bavarchi means a chef, and you see this word in other words like bavarchi khana, meaning a kitchen. Ke saad is associative marker, meaning with. So bavarchi ke saad means with the chef. Milna is the verb to meet, and adding nahi in front, which means no, makes this verb a negative command. Overall, it means don't meet with the chef outside the store. Upar ke kamre se chabi leke aao. Upar means upstairs, and saying ke is a genitive case pronoun. Kamra means room, so it literally means the room of upstairs. It's kamre, not kamra, due to the postposition se right after it, placing the word into the oblique case. Se is the ablative marker, meaning from. Jabi means a key, and leke ao is the imperative of the verb leana, meaning to bring. Overall, the sentence means bring the key from the room upstairs. And finally, let's add a bit of variation. In Hindi, adhyapak ke kaksha se nikalne ke baad jo vidyarthi shanti se par rahe the, wo bhagar khel ke meydan mein khelne chale gaye. And in Urdu, ustad ke jammat se nikalne ke baad jo talaba khamoshi se par rahe the, wo bhagar khel ke meydan mein khelne chale gaye. First, adhyapak and ustad both mean teacher. One is derived from Sanskrit, the other from Persian. Kaksha and jamat mean classroom. Se, again, is the ablative marker, meaning from, and the verb nikalna means to leave. Gebad is antessive, meaning after. So far we have after the teacher left the classroom. Next is a relative clause marked by jo. Vidyarti in Hindi and talaba in Urdu both mean students. Then, shanti se in Hindi and khamoshi se in Urdu both mean quietly. I should also mention that khamoshi se is used in Hindi as well. Khamosh means quiet, so adding se means in a quiet way, quietly. Parna means to read, but it can also mean to study, and parrehete is the past continuous, meaning was studying. Now we have, after the teacher left the classroom, children who were studying quietly, Bhakar is the verb bhagna, to run, followed by kar, which is a conjunctive form, meaning it's joined to another verb. That verb is at the end of the sentence, khelne chalege. Khelna means to play, and adding ne makes it an infinitive, so to play. Chalna means to walk, to move and to go, and adding ge puts it in the past tense. Khel ke medan means a playground, literally playing field, and me means in. So overall, the sentence means, after the teacher left the classroom, children who were studying quietly ran out to the playground. Thanks for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, be sure to leave a like and keep the discussion going in the comments. Please drop me suggestions on what my next video should be on as well. Thanks for watching and have a nice day.